And now it's my pleasure to present today's presenter, Mark Stiving. He, Mark is a chief pricing educator at Impact Pricing, and he has over 25 years of pricing, coaching, and leadership experience, helping companies focus the value they deliver to their customers. He's also author of several books, including Sell Selling Value, How to Win More Deals at Higher Prices. So with that, Mark, welcome, and I am going to share controls. All right, thank you, Nick, I appreciate it. Um, while we're playing with the technology, would everybody who's in the room, just for kicks, type something that you purchased recently into the chat bar. Uh, so if you can find the chat instead of the questions, I'd just love to see something that you bought recently. <clears throat> and Nick, how are we doing for technology? Uh, I can hear you, you can hear me. Um, and Are you seeing the screen? I am seeing the screen and we are ready to roll. Beautiful, beautiful. I don't see anybody typing though. Nobody uh, yeah, wants they might to not share be able something to see the chat, but they can see the questions. So um, okay, feel free to enter them in the question bar if you have that available. There we go. Got a few coming in. Oh, so they're not in the chat. So let me pop open my questions and see what they look like, just for kicks. Oh, and I can't see them. So it's okay. Like new Forget car, that. wireless home speaker, <laughs> lawnmower. Okay. Oh yeah, lawnmower, nice. Beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so one of the reasons I like to do ask that question is because to me, the single most fundamental concept in all of business is what you see on the screen right now. And that's buyers trade money for value. This is just fundamental. The only reason you bought beer or a lawnmower or a new car is because you thought there was more value to you than it cost you in money. And this is absolutely true for every single one of your customers, right? The only reason somebody buys something from you is because they believe there's more value than it costs them in money. And so what we always wanna do when we're thinking about uh, our business is put ourselves in the shoes of our buyers to say, what is it that they're thinking? Right, I'd love to know what this guy's thinking, but what is it that they're thinking? And, and if we could understand that, then we'd be able to create better products, we'd be able to sell our value better, we'd be able to close more deals at higher prices. So it's all about understanding what does value mean. Um, I'm an expert in value-based pricing. I've been thinking about it for, oh, forever, it feels like. But if you think about value-based pricing, value comes first. We have to understand value before we ever think about what's the right price. And so let's think about some deals that happens in your business, right? Think about the last deal that you won. Here's why you want it. Because you delivered great value and you didn't charge too much money for it. So the buyer buys, woohoo, woo right? This is good news. We wanted the buyer to buy. But now flip it around and what happens when we lost a deal? So we lost a deal for two reasons, by the way. It's always for two reasons. The price was too high and the buyer didn't believe there was enough value. Both of those reasons exist. Because imagine for a second that you lost a deal. What if you had lowered the price to zero? Could you have won the deal? Sure. So the price was too high. But on the other hand, what if you could do a better job at making sure the buyer understood the value of your product? Could you have won the deal? Maybe. So when we think about this value side, there's two things that could possibly be wrong. One, maybe there's not enough value. Maybe your product isn't the best fit for that customer. Maybe that customer's problem isn't big enough that it's worth the amount of money that you wanna charge for your product. That's okay. It just means it wasn't our customer. It wasn't our ICP. Or, and this is the problem we really want to deal with, maybe we didn't do a good enough job communicating our value. Maybe we didn't understand what that buyer truly needed and wanted. And so we couldn't say the words that resonated so that they deeply understood what we were delivering. And in both cases, we lose the deal because the buyer didn't believe there was enough value for the price that we were charging. So as a, as a pricing person, I'm a huge fan of holding high prices and figuring out how we achieve high prices. And we do that by understanding the value that we're delivering to our customers. 
So here's the magic question. What is value? In the 30 years I've been in this business, I can just say that value is one of the most ambiguous, hard to understand words in the English language. Here are a list of a, a lot of different ways to think about value. And we're gonna talk about many of these today as we go through the webinar. But when we start thinking about what's value or what's value in subscriptions or how do experts think of value relative to non-experts or we'll spend a bunch of time with inherent value and relative value, as we start thinking about each one of these concepts, they're really important to our company because as we understand them, those decisions, those pieces of value should be affecting a lot of decisions we make inside the company. I like to start with market segmentation, uh, packaging, what features are you gonna put in which packages, what are the pricing metrics, pricing of course, uh, price segmentation, how do we raise prices, marketing messages, selling value. All of these are places that, that we can make better once we understand what does value really mean to our customers. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today, is what does value really mean to our customers? We'll do a little bit of how, do you can, how can you use it, but most of today is let's talk about value. And let's start with my favorite. I love this concept of inherent versus relative value. Inherent value is the value of solving the problem. So I'll ask you, I can't see you, I can't see responses, but I'll just ask the question and I'll tell you because I know what answer you're gonna give. Um, how much do you value having air to breathe? And I'm sure the answer to that is a lot, right? Everything I own, you can have it. But then again, when we think about relative value, I just, capture, just captured some fresh Reno air. I live here in Reno, Nevada. Uh, I'm willing to sell it. Who wants to buy it? And I'm pretty sure I know the answer to that question too. Nobody. And why is that? Because you have all the air around you for free. You don't need my fresh Reno air. So think about the value of air for a second. It's either worth everything you own or absolutely nothing, depending on if we're talking about inherent value or relative value. So inherent value is what's the value of solving the problem? Relative value is what's the value relative to the alternatives. And so imagine for a second that your significant other nudges you tomorrow morning and says, hey honey, I'd really like it if you would learn to play the guitar and sing me a love song. Oh, that just pulls at your heartstrings, doesn't it? You're like, oh, I have to go do this now. But by the way, you just said yes to the will I decision. The will I decision is will I buy something in this product category? And that has everything to do with inherent value. What's the value of solving the problem? What's the value of making your significant other happy by learning to play the guitar? It's huge. Of course I'm going to go do that. So what do you do next? You go to the guitar store. You start looking at different guitars. Which one feels good? Which one sounds good? What's the right price range for you? Price becomes really important as we're making the which guitar are we gonna buy decision. So when we think about th these two different decisions, will I and which one, will I has everything to do with the inherent value and which one is all about the relative value. What's the value of this one guitar relative to the alternatives? So when we think about the value, the buyer's value journey, the buyer has to go figure out how much value is there in our product. Here's what they typically do. They typically make a will I decision, am I gonna buy a guitar? Yes, okay, which one am I gonna go buy? And then they buy one. When they're making that will I decision, it's all about inherent value. They're focused on what's the value of solving the problem, and they're, they're not really price sensitive. Something besides price is driving that decision. When they switch to the which one decision, they're now saying, hey, um, what's the value of this one relative to the alternatives, and price becomes really important. Most of the time, people make both of these decisions. Most new purchases go through both decisions.
to see this, we're going to start building up what we'll call a buyer's value map. How is it that a buyer is making a decision as they're learning about the value of any given product out there? And so we'll put it in a two by two quadrant. And as all of you know, any consultant, any really good consultant has their very own two by two quadrant. Uh, so this one is mine, which makes me a really good consultant. Um, so <laughs> buyers typically start with will I, they're gonna make the decision, will I buy something in the product category? Then they move on to which one am I going to go buy? Uh, so let's go through a few examples just to make it really obvious. Um, your car just broke down. Guess what? You just said, hey, I need to go buy a new car, assuming you can't fix it. I need to go buy a new car. You just said yes to the will I decision. Then you're going to go shop. Which car am I going to go buy? Your refrigerator broke down. Uh, you're going to go to a fancy ball and you need a new outfit. So, so you're saying to yourself yes to the will I, and then you go to the store and start shopping around for which one. Um, if you're selling CRM systems, a company says, hey, you know what? I'm tired of using Excel. I guess I ought to uh, graduate to a real CRM. What do they do next? They start comparing HubSpot and Salesforce and all of the different CRMs that are out there. So they're making the which one decision. So buyers go from will I to which one, especially when they're first buying a product. Now, Gardner gives us a really good quote. 57% of the purchase decision is complete before a customer even calls a supplier. What does this mean? This means that when your refrigerator broke down, you didn't rush off to the store to go shop refrigerators. You went online and looked at a whole bunch of different refrigerators to say, hey, what style do I want? What's the price range I'm gonna be dealing with? You're doing a whole lot of this research on your own. And so what that really means to us is that our buyers do some work without salespeople being involved. And then of course our salespeople can get involved. This is the buyer. This is not us deciding how they behave. This is them deciding how they behave. This is the process they go through as they're deciding what are they gonna go buy? How are they gonna go solve their problem? That leads us to the very first, we'll call it a value journey. What's the journey that a buyer goes through as they're making the decision? This is called the analytical journey. In the analytical journey, they make a will I decision. Something happened, they said, hey, I've got this problem, I need to go solve it, let me go buy something to solve this problem. They go online, they do a bunch of research to figure out what are the alternatives, and then they reluctantly go to a store and talk to a salesperson. By the way, the same thing is true for our B2B buyers who are buying a CRM system. They say, hey, I need to buy a CRM. Let me go online. Let me look at all these alternatives. Okay, now I'll go talk to a HubSpot salesperson. Now I'll go talk to a Salesforce salesperson. And so this analytical journey, when the salesperson gets involved, we need to understand what is it that that buyer is looking at? Well, if I'm a Salesforce salesperson, I happen to know the buyer is looking at other alternatives. So I need to show what are my advantages relative to the alternatives they're looking at. So we're now selling relative value. We need to understand what that is, why we can charge more than, <clears throat> than our competitors because our products are better. On the other hand, sometimes people only make a will I decision. Now, since I can't see and interact with you, I'm just gonna tell my own story on this one, if you, might, if you don't mind. 1999, I was in New Zealand, Queensland, Queenstown, uh, bungee, bungee jumping, or I should say the adrenaline capital of the world. And, uh, and I went bungee jumping. It cost me, uh, I think it was like $150 to go bungee jumping over the Shotover River. It was amazing. Now, if you were to ask me, Mark, did you, um, did you think to yourself you could go here at the Shotover River or you could wait and go someplace else to go bungee jumping? Or was it just a, are you going to do it or not decision? And, and I'll tell you, it was just, I was going to do it or not. There wasn't a competitive alternative anywhere in my mind. I was going to go do this. And I paid 150 bucks. So notice I just made a will I decision. I never went on to make a which one decision. Okay. Now ask, I'm assuming you're asking me this question, Mark, would you have paid 200 for that? I probably would have. How about 250? Yes, I would have. How about 300? 
Maybe. How about 500? Probably not. Here's the point. I wasn't that price sensitive. Price wasn't driving that decision. Something else is driving that decision. So imagine that you're a good friend of mine, you're with me, we're in New Zealand, we're at the Shot Over River, it's only $150 to go bungee jumping. Um, in your mind right now, raise your hand if you're gonna go bungee jumping with me. Now I've done this enough that I can tell you that two people raised their hands and the rest of you didn't. Okay, so it was 150 bucks, but, but would you change your mind at 125? Would you change your mind at 100? How about 75? And almost nobody changed their mind. And that's because price wasn't driving this decision. Something else was driving this decision. When we think about this will I decision or will I only decision, when buyers are only making a will I decision, they're not price sensitive. They didn't consider a competitive alternative, so they were only looking at the inherent value of our product. Let me give you a few more really quick examples. A popcorn at the movie theater, you decide what movie theater you want to go to, what movie you want to see, you walk in the door, you look up at the concession stand and ask yourself, am I going to take out a mortgage today for popcorn or not? And why is that? Because you can't buy popcorn somewhere else, you can only buy it there once you're in the movie. Okay, you're driving down the road, you see the sign says last gas for 75 miles or 75 kilometers, and you, um, you look down at the gas gauge and there's an eighth of a tank of gas left. You pull off. The price of gas is four times the price it is in the city. Are you buying gas? Yeah, you are, because there's no competitive alternative. It's only a will I decision. Here's my favorite example though. If you are an iPhone user, you are probably thinking to yourself, should I upgrade to the new iPhone or not? But what you're not thinking is, should I upgrade to the new iPhone or switch to Android? Those of us who use iPhones are only gonna use iPhone. We're only gonna buy the next iPhone. We're only making a will I decision. By the way, Android has 72% worldwide market share in mobile phones. Apple has 85% of the profit in the industry. And why is that? Because Apple is selling a will I product. For Android, there are many competitive alternatives. And so think about a different value journey. If you're gonna sell an Apple phone, or some other item, there's a journey out there where buyers say, yes, I have a problem. I need to go solve this problem. Hang on, I've got the, the Apple color. There we go. Um, so, so buyers say, hey, I wanna go solve a problem. And then they just go look at your product and buy your product without looking at a competitive alternative. They only made a will I decision. We call this the trust journey, right? They just trust you enough. They know that you're gonna solve their problem for them. They don't wanna go spend a bunch of time looking at alternatives. And when someone comes to you and they're not looking at competitive alternatives, you don't wanna be talking about how are we different from our competitors. You wanna be talking about what's the value of solving the problem. It's what's the value of having a CRM, not what's the value of our CRM versus our competitor's CRM. So we think about inherent value as the value of solving the problem. Now these buyers are not price sensitive. These buyers are just gonna buy from you. You don't have to do deep discounts. And so my recommendation for you is always assume Okay, one of us is having a tech problem. Sorry, there. Always, assu always assume your buyer is on a trust journey until you know otherwise. Um, one of my favorite lines, I want to know if someone's looking at a competitive alternative or not. I'm not going to ask them, hey, are you looking at our competitors? Instead, here's a really good question to ask. If you don't buy this, what will you do? 
And the implication is there's no competitive alternative. And if they say, oh, we're looking at your competitor, great, I just learned something. If they say nothing, I learned a lot. They're making a will I only decision. Now, for will I, for which one doesn't matter, but let's quickly jump into the which one decision that our buyers are making. And when buyers are making a which one decision, they have to decide which one is worth it. And so here we've got Del Monte Green Beans at $1.69, Safeway Kitchens at $1.49. This is the store brand. Uh, if you're not in the US, Safeway's a, a store, a, a grocery store. And so Safeway Kitchens is a store brand version. Um, I normally ask my audience to so, so pick one. You have to go to the store, you have to buy one. Which one do you choose? And you know, half the half of them choose Del Monte, half of them choose Safeway. And then when I ask why, here are the answers. Del Monte, higher quality, my parents have always used it, I trust it more, better brand name. I asked about Safeway, why'd you buy Safeway? Green beans are green beans, it's probably the same green bean made in the same factory with the same can and a different label put on it. Um, and so these are all great reasons, but what's fascinating is it doesn't matter how you made the decision, everybody made the decision the exact same way. They said Del Monte is 20 cents more. Is it worth it? And some people think it's worth it and some people don't. But what I love about this story is it actually doesn't matter what's true. The only thing that matters is what your buyers believe. Do they believe that your product is better than your competitor's product? Doesn't matter if it's true or not perceived value is how all of our buyers are making decisions. So, so it's very possible that it's the exact same green bean in the exact same can with different labels on it. I don't know. But if you believe that's true, you're probably buying Safeway Kitchens. And if you believe that's not true, you're probably buying Del Monte. It has everything to do with what you believe, not what is true. So let's extend this even more and talk about value in subscriptions. If you're in a subscription business today, uh, your whole goal is I need to go win some customers and then I want to get keep, get them to stay with us. And eventually I want them to pay me more money. So we think about value in this world of subscriptions. Um, here on our chart, we've got what's how much value does the customer perceive? And on the horizontal axis, what's the expected lifetime value of that customer to us? We have these list of potential customers, a big blob of customers that we aren't dealing with today. And, and some of them aren't gonna get much value. Some of them would get a lot of value. We just haven't won them yet. We have, to, we have to spend some time winning them. But we think about our existing customers. Some of our existing customers probably aren't getting much value. They don't like us. Uh, some of our customers love us. They think that we're amazing and they get a ton of value. And that's probably really highly correlated with the expected lifetime value of our customer. So the ones who don't like us very much are probably gonna churn out relatively soon. The ones who love us are probably gonna stay forever and we're gonna get a long uh, a stream of revenue from them. So when we think about this, potential customers, the only thing they can go on is perceived value. What do they believe? What have you told them? What have you communicated to them? Our existing customers, on the other hand, they have experienced value. They're using the product. They know what the product does for them. And that's awesome. But here's the next question. How about proven value? What happens is when a year goes by, it's time for our product to come up for renewal. We did a great job. We delivered a ton of value. But did anyone document it? Does the customer actually know the value that we delivered? Have they documented all of the value we delivered? If we've proven the value, it's much more likely we can keep them from churning or switching to something else because we can demonstrate there really is value here. So think about proven value. And each of these different values that we start thinking about, for the potential customers, we need to do a great job at communicating value to the perceptions of our buyers so that we can win new customers. These customers down at that think they're not getting enough value from us, how do we keep them? 
How do we keep them from churning? And the ones at the very top, we need to make sure we're talking about value and how they're getting so much value from us so that they pay us more money next year. How do we grow them? So win, keep, and grow are the three revenue buckets that subscription companies have to deal with. And that has everything to do with how our buyers experience and perceive value. Now, what's fascinating is that even though our existing customers are experiencing value, it's still their perception. They still don't know the truth. They don't remember what it was like before they had your product. So have we proven it? Have we documented it? Possibly my favorite tool for understanding value, and this aligns very closely with the way Leverage Point thinks as well, is a tool I call Value Tables. Uh, value Tables is a, is a really powerful way for companies to start to understand what does value mean from their customers' perceptives, perception. So Forrester gives us a great quote that says, 62% of vendor salespeople are knowledgeable about their company and products. What that really means is that they can show up and give the pitch. But here's the better part of the quote. Only 22% understand their buyer's business issues and where they can help. Do we understand what's actually going on inside our buyer's business? Because here's a fact, B2B value is measured in incremental profit. The only reason a company buys a product from you is because they believe they are going to make more profit from buying this than it costs them in money. That's it. And so you may recall my favorite saying, buyers trade money for value. Let's modify that a little bit for B2B. And we could say B2B buyers trade money for incremental profit. If you are not able to define the value of your product and incremental profit to your customers, you don't understand the value of your products. You can't sell the value of your products. How do we do this then? I recommend using something called a value table. The value table has four different columns on it, solution, problem, result, and value. Uh, we won't go into too much detail here, but I'll give you a couple examples that are fun and interesting. Uh, the solution is either your product or it's a feature of your product that you really love. Why did you build that feature? Because it solved a problem for your customer. So can you articulate that problem? And, and by the way, I've done these with hundreds of companies, and that's the hardest thing for companies to figure out. What's the problem we're really solving? And the reason it's so hard for you to figure that out is because you have something called the curse of knowledge. You know so much about your product that you've forgotten what it's like to not know it. So you have a, someone has a problem, they buy your solution, what's the result they might achieve? In the world of B2B, I always put results in KPIs. What KPI are we gonna move? Can we make it quantitative? And then lastly, value. If you've got your result in a KPI and a number that's gonna move, you can use business acumen to help figure out how much incremental profit you will make your customer if you can achieve that result. And so let's go through a couple examples. Oh, before we do that real quickly, features and benefits. Typically we hear the words features and benefits. I would allocate features to that solution side. So those are our features or it could be the whole product. We think about benefits, um, that would be the result that someone gets. What are they trying to achieve? So let's go through a quick fast food example. This is a company that makes most of the technology that goes into running drive-through windows at fast food restaurants. And so they, uh, they have a long range communications radio. And I gotta tell you, I was confused. Why the heck does a fast food place need a long range communications radio? And it turns out, what's the problem they can solve? Put yourself in the shoes of McDonald's for a second and you're using this phrase. Our drive through lane slows down when the customer has to wait for us to prepare the food. Okay, that feels like a problem, absolutely. So what's the result? By taking orders at the edge of the parking lot, we have more time to prepare the food resulting in two more cars per hour during peak times. 
So you'll notice we've got a quantitative result. Can we turn that into profit dollars? Of course we can. Two cars times three peak hours times 360 days times $10 per car times 60% margin is almost $13,000 a year for having a long range communications radio. That's not bad. By the way, you can solve more than one problem with the exact same product or the exact same feature. So they had a different problem. When customers wait in a long line, they sometimes drive off, meaning we lose business. What's the result? By taking orders at the edge of the parking lot, customers are less likely to drive off, resulting in one more car per hour during peak times. The math is the same. It's just one car instead of two cars, and it gets an additional $6,500 per year. So notice we just put incremental profit numbers on a long-range communications radio. That's pretty powerful. But watch us do the exact same thing for a small feature of a product. This is a connector, it's a waterproof connector. And what you'll notice on the bottom, the black base on the bottom, there's a little tiny gray circle on the left-hand side. And that little gray circle is a screen that lets air in and out. So what's the value of that screen? If I were to ask you, what, how much more money are you gonna make somebody because you have that screen in there? Could you answer that question? And yes, we can, we just have to go through the process. What's the problem that we're gonna solve with that screen? So we put ourselves in the shoes of a city manager, city planner. They say, we have a lot of electronic failures on top of light poles due to condensation from large temperature swings. Citizens complain that our city is not safe. What's the result? The vent allows the escape of condensation, lengthening the life of the electronics, resulting in 20% fewer failures. For 100,000 light poles, the normal failure rate would be 1,000 per year. That would decrease by about 200 per year. Excellent, let's use our business acumen and say, what's the value of that? If we save 200 failures at $1,000 per repair, that's $200,000 or $2 per pole per year. We just put a dollar value on a tiny feature of a product. Value tables are amazingly powerful when you think this way. So what are you going to talk to your customers about? As we start thinking about explaining our value to them, we have experts and non-experts. And let's start with the non-experts. Imagine that your grandfather walks into a computer store and wants to buy his very first computer. And the lady behind the counter, the geek behind the counter says, um, you know, this one's got an Intel Core i5, 8 gigabytes of memory, 512 gigabytes SSD. And the guy's thinking, I have no idea what any of that means. The features are irrelevant. If we're selling features, we're not resonating with this buyer. On the other hand, imagine a geek walks in and wants to buy a computer and talk to the salesperson. And the salesperson says, uh, hey, this one will hold all your photos and it does email so you can stay in touch with your family. They're thinking, are you stupid? Right, I, tell me the specs, I wanna know the specs. Here's what's going on. Experts are able to translate your features into their benefits. They can translate the solutions to the results they're after. Non-experts can't. Everybody is buying the results. The only difference is experts are able to do the translation. But here's a really important question. How often are your new customers experts in your product? And I would argue the answer is not very often. And so we need to learn to stop talking about our features. In fact, one of my favorite sayings, nobody cares about your product, nobody. But here's it, they all have one thing in common, Nobody cares about your product. What we need to do is put ourselves in the shoes of our buyers and think, what are they thinking? What do they value? And what this person is thinking, is it the same as what this person is thinking? Or the same as what this person is thinking? 
or the same as this person is thinking? Obviously, the answer is no. And so buyers trade money for value. What we have to do is understand what our value really is. Um, my own personal quick ad, I do a value optimization bootcamp for companies. Um, but what I really want to do is remind you, we talked today about what is value. And we talked about most of those um, on the left. We didn't really address on how do you use it. But you can imagine once you understand what value really means to your customers, you can make so much better decisions in your packaging, your pricing metrics, your price segmentation, your marketing, and especially selling value. Nick, it is up to you. Thank you very much, Mark, for sharing your insights. Um, and just as a reminder to the audience, there's still time to answer questions. We got a few during the session, um, so you can feel free to enter them in the right-hand go to webinar panel. Um, and let me just make sure I'm sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, so I, now I'd like to introduce Brian Hannon, who's VP of Sales here at Leverage Point, um, who's going to share a little bit more about our how our SaaS platform can help you um, capture the, the communicate the uh, value grids that Mark just talked about in an interactive format that should help um, boost commercial outcomes for sales and marketing. So Brian, I'm going to pass you controls now, and here you go. Great, thanks, Nick. Hopefully you can hear me now. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so I'm going to show you guys a quick demonstration of one of our value stories. And uh, what you can see on the screen, hopefully, are a set of demo value stories that we have. Um, so we have you know, all different types that we can show. Uh, we're going to keep it simple today, but anyone who's interested who wants to go into more detail on uh, what a value story is and uh, how we create them and how we help you create them in a way that your customers will appreciate and more specifically allow, as we've heard you know, over the past uh, almost 40 minutes, to be able to focus on the value that you're providing versus just the, the features that you're providing. We all know, and I'm a salesperson for a long time, that we get so caught up in talking about the features and the benefits of our product, how cool the technologies are that we're coming up with or we'll be delivering soon that we can, at times, completely ignore the value that we're delivering. So what we try to do in these value stories is really shift that focus. We, we take away the features and benefits and we provide a talk track for the salespeople to really focus on value. Uh, you can think of our value stories as a combination of a PowerPoint presentation with a mathematical model embedded inside and it's not PowerPoint, it's actually shown through a browser, which you're, you're seeing here. These stories are editable, uh, so the salespeople can open them up and begin making changes to the stories based on who they'll be speaking with. I'll show you just some brief clips of a, a typical value story, but you can think of them as broken out in chapters. So chapter one, usually we'll talk about the offering itself, so here's where uh, you might reuse some of your product information, will work with your marketing people to uh, use your logo, use your color scheme, your branding, uh, and, and reuse the, the, the product slides. But again, this is really just an introduction. Our, our focus today should be around value, and that's what we quickly get into during the stories. Uh, we then shift from uh, a, a quick discussion about the offering to a discussion about the customer's operations. So what is happening within their environment and how can we use that knowledge to better understand the value that we deliver? The goal here is really to be interactive with the customer. So they're explaining to us, for example, in this case, how many uh, vehicles BMW might be manufacturing per year, or they might be telling us how much undercoating that they use to coat their vehicles. We then build that into the value story, and BMW can start to quickly see that we're creating this value story with them. This is a, a, a partnership. Uh, 
as we get into the next chapter, we start to talk about the specific value drivers. And here's how we're gonna be delivering value. Sometimes there's negative value. And we start to make estimations about the value based on some of the information we just gathered, maybe based on other information that we set up prior to the call itself. Uh, we can display you know, in lots of different ways. Here we're showing you know, on an annual basis based on 40,000 vehicles per year, here's how much value we think we can deliver BMW for our new coding. The third chapter then breaks down the problem into pieces. So we've given an overall estimation. We know we have some work to do yet with BMW at, during our conversation. So we break it down into the three value drivers that we've talked about and we show them one by one and we give BMW the opportunity to make changes to the inputs based on, again, their knowledge of their situation, which becomes critical in building a value story that they will uh, believe and that they'll agree with. So chapter three goes into individual pieces and then chapter four will go into an overall summary. So we have all different uh, ways to summarize. We can summarize the overall value in uh, what's called a waterfall chart here. This is very common in the pricing world and it can become more common as salespeople get more comfortable talking about value through this type of chart. But we also have uh, other charts that we can use, charts and graphs. Sometimes they're on an annual basis so you can show value changing over time. Sometimes it's just an overall summary, not getting into too much detail. And again, the information uh, about the customer can be edited uh, in the slides as we go along so things will change dynamically. And then finally, the uh, information can be saved so we can save our value story. We can uh, generate an output, whether it's a PDF or a PowerPoint. Um, oh, here, download. So we can do either one of those and that will basically generate that for the customer. Uh, we can also send them a link. So we have this feature we've added uh, the past year called ShareLink which will allow us to send that directly to customers and they can then make edits, make uh, changes to the, uh, the, the value story on their own. And as a salesperson, I can kind of see that happening. So the benefits uh, of this process are significant and we see this all the time. You're able to increase your close rate when you're having these value discussions during your sales process. Uh, you're able to decrease your sales cycle. You're able to increase the uh, the average uh, profit per per uh, per deal. So your your discount requests start to go down, and your overall margins start to go up. So lots of benefits here. And again, as I said before, we'd love to show you an example of one of these value stories. Just let us know. All right, thank you, Brian, for um, for reviewing that. And for those of you, so for those of you interested in learning more about leverage point value stories, um, feel free to let us know in the exit survey, um, and you, we can follow up with more information on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and I know there's some of you in the audience that received an invite from your internal uh, sales or commercial excellence group, um, so you can also feel free to follow up with them because you may already have access to a leverage point value story. Uh, which um, they can set you up with uh, right away. So um, feel free to reach out to them, or if you'd like to connect with them, feel free to say so in the, in the exit survey. Um, so now it's time for the Q&A section. Um, so Mark, I'm actually gonna put up a, a second screen here, um, which is the one we talked about earlier, which is um, what is value, which you went over through the presentation and where to use it. So um, some of the questions I think were um, falling into the latter category. So I figured good to have that there to prompt the discussion, but feel free to enter questions into the panel when ready. So uh, ready to get things going, Mark? I am, I can't see the questions, so I'm just gonna have to listen to you. All right, I'll read them out for you. All right, so the first one is, um, here's a good one. So how can B2B teams reinforce their differentiation um, early in the customer journey? So before the, the detailed financial discussions start to take place? Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really interesting question. L let me start by talking about the difference between B2B and B2C sales, if I may, because this is actually really important. In B2B, if you're selling something of value, it will come down to a business case. It will come down to, am I helping my company make more money? In B2C, that doesn't exist, right? I buy a new shirt and it's not gonna make me more money, 
right? No one can do that calculation. This is how much more money is this shirt going to buy, uh, make Mark? And so we buy things ourselves based on uh, feelings, emotions. It makes my life easier. It makes me feel better. This is true inside a company that you're selling to. So when you think about selling B2B and you're selling a high value item, absolutely, we have to get to the financials before we get the sale closed but we have to get the attention of each of the individual buyer personas or buyers that are involved in the sale. And so to do that, we're really stealing tactics from B2C people, right? We're saying, hey, this is gonna make your job easier. It's gonna help you personally. And, and those are the ways that we're gonna make sure that, that, uh, that we're gonna be able to get their attention early in the sales cycle so that we can get to the business case. Right, makes a lot of sense. Um, so the next one, uh, let's, let's go here. So, um, so going back to the slide on will I, which one scenarios, uh, how do you, um, consider that where the job is being done in a completely different way? So let this, uh, an example here be a, a software application coming up against a manual or homegrown, um, solution. Uh, how do you start to categorize that? Does that impact the way you think about it? Yeah, so, so what we're always trying to do is understand what is it that our buyers are thinking, not necessarily how do I want to categorize it. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine, uh, let's go back to the CRM example for a second, and someone's using Excel today to manage all this, and, and so they're saying, hey, look, this is working kind of, but it's not working as well as it should. Mm -hmm. Let me look at a, a different alternative. So they're always comparing the next thing to what they have today. That's the will I decision. And so, so that's when I think of will I, something besides price is really driving that decision. But as soon as they say, oh, am I going to go with HubSpot or am I going to go with Salesforce? Suddenly price is really important to them, right? They're mm -hmm. looking at the price of each one of those two and trying to compare the two together. Um, and so when you think about what's the inherent value in terms of a will I decision for a CRM relative to Excel, what we're asking is what are the problems you're going to solve with your CRM that they can't solve with Excel? Hmm. Makes sense. And under kind of underscores the importance of good discovery and also learning your marketing messaging from that. Um, okay. So then uh, I've got one on uh, willingness to pay. So, um, so the buyer journeys you went over, um, how do they intersect with some of the quantitative research out there on, you know, willingness to pay in terms of like Joyce, Max Diff, et cetera. Yeah. Can I say I'm just recently coming to this conclusion? And that is sure. that these statistical techniques aren't that valuable in the B2B world. Mm. Um, so in B2C, they're crucial because, again, I can't figure out what's the value of a shirt or what's the value of, of a refrigerator to a homeowner. Right. I, I just don't know those answers. Right. I don't know how to calculate those answers. But on the other hand, if I've got a direct salesperson who's talking to a customer, what's so much more important than any statistical analysis I can do is what are the specific problems I'm solving for that customer and how much value are we delivering to that customer? And, and if we can do that enough times, we've got a really good feel for what our pricing should be, how we communicate value. And, and so for us to do statistics on that doesn't feel as important, as relevant, to, uh, to the decisions that we have to make. Now, I wanna give you one more example. Think about someone who's selling the value of the product for a second. And so, Nick, you're gonna buy a product and, and, I, and I come ask you the question, how much are you willing to pay for this? And, and let's pretend that you're actually gonna answer the question honestly to the best of your ability. Do you actually understand all the value I can deliver? before I've used all of my selling value communications techniques? And the answer is no. And so the, whatever number you give me, honestly or not, but if you give me an honest number, it isn't truly your willingness to pay hmm. because I haven't communicated the value to you yet. And so when I start thinking that way, I start thinking the statistical analysis for B2B direct sales situations, right? It makes very little sense to me. Makes sense. And I think uh, that's something we talk about a lot um, in terms of identifying unique value and the importance of engaging a value conversation as well, um, capturing that, those customer data points that in the other direction may not be readily apparent to the seller. 
and kind of the combined process gets you a lot closer to what the actual value, um, the unique value for that customer is. So um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so here's a good one on, on fee at risk. So this is actually a popular topic with um, our next month's presenter is uh, so in a lot of companies, uh, they, they, they talk about, you know, value as part of their marketing and sales process, but tracking actual value delivered, um, you know, is, is another kind of crucial part post sale. And, um, you know, what do you think about um, uh, possible uh, uh, fee at risk in terms of uh, you can, we, if you reduce cost by X percent, um, you get a rebate or a credit. Um, and if we don't, then it goes in the other direction. Um, what do you think of, of, of extending that all the way through the sale in terms of contractual terms and, and the post sale as well? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to reframe the question for a second sure. into what are we actually charging for? Mm -hmm. Right. And one of the decisions that we make in the SaaS world all the time is the pricing metric. What do you charge for? So Google charges per click, um, LinkedIn charges per in-mail, Dropbox charges per terabyte of storage, right? It's, and so what do you charge for? And when you think about fee at risk type, um, contracts, what you're really saying is I'm charging you for a solution to the problem. I'm not charging you for my time. I'm not charging you for my effort. I'm charging you for this outcome. Now, when you are able to price relative to outcomes, um, it's probably the single best way to do pricing metrics, mm -hmm. but it's really, really hard because there's always this debate. And, and we see this inside companies. Um, as a pricing person, I, uh, I move the ASPs up in my company. And I go to the CEO and I say, hey, guess what? We moved ASPs up, didn't pricing team do great? And sales goes, what are you talking about? We did a much better job at selling value. We had that big training program and negotiations course. And marketing goes, what are you saying? We did this beautiful marketing campaign and, and those higher ASPs are because of what we did. And so sometimes, most of the time, it's really hard to get people to commit to measuring outcomes the same way. And that's why we rarely see outcome-driven pricing. Um, probably my favorite outcome-driven pricing that you see are companies like PayPal, right? We're going to take 2% of the revenue. And can I just tell you that I can't wait for the day that I pay PayPal a million dollars, right? That'll make me happy when I do that. <laughs> No, great, ta great takeaway, and, and and I think overall, um, the more you use value and outcomes as a means of aligning teams, uh, the better, and that's uh, I think an important takeaway there. Um, so let me just go through, see where we're going. Um, look at my email inbox. Sometimes they come through there. Uh, so here's one on. Um, identifying types of buyers. So customers, um, understanding the type of customer you're dealing with, whether they're a price buyer or a value buyer, um, they might not appreciate that additional value um, in order to justify spending more. So do you have any thoughts around, you know, how, to, how that fits into your framework? Sure. Um, so one of the things, if, if we're talking about a direct salesperson walking out and talking to a specific buyer, one of the things we have to understand is what are the problems they're trying to solve? So what matters to them? And once we understand that, then we can sell the value. So for someone to say, look, I'm not buying value, what, what I would interpret that to saying is they don't care about this problem, right? They would, they would rather just solve the basic problem and they don't wanna solve any problems on top of that. And, mm -hmm. and so maybe that's not our customer or maybe we've packaged our products in a good, better, best format so that we've built the good product specifically for this price buyer and yet people who truly want to buy value, they're going to buy our better or our best products. That makes a ton of sense. And that, um, you know, that, that also shows value and outcome, um, getting value, getting value early in the process can also help make sure you don't waste time on those price buyers or funnel them to an alternate solution. So I think um, value early in the process, it underscores the, the importance of that from the very first sales call. Um, so I think that's all the questions I'm seeing in both things. So I'm just going to take this on to the next uh, screen, which is next month's webinar. So before you go, um, reminder to pre-register, we have another really strong one with uh, Todd Snellgrove, an audience favorite. Um, and he's going to be exploring best practices and in incorporating value quantification 
uh, in communication early on in the innovation process. He's got 20 years of war stories. Um, he's seen some of the world's leading B2B companies have great successes and great failures. So he's gonna be sharing some of those stories um, on April 30th. So feel free to pre-register in the survey. Um, and also we have folks that kind of come to every month um, and register. So uh, I included an option in this month's survey if you'd like to sign up for the balance of this year's webinars as well, if you'd like to sign up for the entire 2024 series. So if you'd like to do that, save yourself a few, few clicks, uh, feel free to do that in the exit survey as well. And um, so that will be it for us today. So big thank you for Mark for sharing all of your insights. Uh, we look forward to having you back. And uh, for all from all of us here at Leverage Point, um, have a great rest of your week and um, a great start to your spring.